It's my pleasure to moderate this panel with uh, the experts that I have here today. Um, I'd first like to introduce you to Alana Drubin. She is a partner at Jackson Hertogs. Um, she's, her field is um, employment, immigration, law. She's um, one of the experts in our AILA community. She also has extensive experience in counseling and conducting an external audits in I-9, in the I-9 arena, anti-discrimination and other employment related issues. So welcome, Alana. Um, Charles Miller, since he was the moderator of the last panel, he didn't fully um, give himself any accolades, but there are many, and they're all in the back of your book. Briefly, <laughs> too long to state, but um, Mr. Miller has been um, really a pillar in the immigration community. Um, he was also previously um, an officer at ICE, and so has that background in that arena as well. Marcin, you're, you're making me younger than I am. I was an INS. Oh, sorry, INS. Well, that was way back then before my time. <laughs> and uh, to really date you, I can tell the audience that, so the California Bar of Specialization, he was on the first committee that actually began that endeavor for California. So, I'm, get, I'm getting older and older. <laughs> okay, so before you know, we go into the dinosaur eras, um, I'll move on. Um, today we have with us, um, unfortunately, um, Harold Beasley um, from Arizona of ICE was unable to attend today. And so we have Eugene Lee, he's a special agent of ICE here today with us. Um, so I, I just, Mr. Lee, could you, um, um, I guess let us know um, just basically what you do at, um, at ICE and um, um, what you can do for us here today. Well, thank you for having me on such short notice. Um, I'm a special agent at the San Francisco office, currently working financial investigations, money laundering and such. Uh, I did work work site enforcement a number of years ago and did participate in I-9 audits, some enforcement operations, and um, went through the process of some civil penalties. I'm not equipped today to answer many questions because I am a little removed from worksite, but uh, I'm here today to get a sense of what is in the minds of HR personnel and the legal community out there right now in terms of worksite enforcement, and would ha be happy to take down any questions anybody has because the ICE headquarters worksite enforcement office out of Washington is having a image workshop coming up this month on June 23rd in San Francisco. And for any of the, uh, those of you who'd like to attend, uh, the registration period just opened on the ICE website under the uh, image tab. Um, the workshop, I don't think there's any charge for it. I don't have the details, they're working on that now, but that will be June 23rd in San Francisco. Great, thank you so much. And um, Mr. Lee has graciously uh, offered to take down any questions that the audience might have, um, and he will be willing to take that back to um, headquarters and see if we can get some answers from upstairs to bring back to the speakers here. So if you have some questions that you would like to ask, um, you can bring them up to me. Just go ahead and... Um, write them down and just you can just place them right here and we'll make sure that we get those to um, to ICE. So moving right along, this is the liability auditing in immigration compliance audits. And we know about this because in the prior panel we were all told that we need to um, audit and audit prior to annoy. And that's key. Um, basically, um, what you're going to be doing in an external auditor is you're going to you're going to be doing an assessment of potential civil and criminal penalties for violations of, and you see right up there on the screen for basically your stat for criminal and civil statutes and agency regulations, as well as looking at anti-discrimination and unfair um, immigration-related exposures. Uh, what Mr. Miller told in the first panel, and I think what we'll 
further talk about in a little bit more detail is we have to look at, you're not just sitting there and going through the audit of what's wrong, but you're actually sitting there and saying, hey, what, what can I do to mitigate? What can I do to reduce my exposure? What can I do, if possible, to eliminate any liabilities that we'll have in the future? For what we have, know as the knowing hire and um, continuing to employ violations as well as all the I-9 paperwork violations. Um, also, a crucial point, which we will go into detail, which did not go into detail at all, I don't even know if you touched upon it, are um, the mitigation and aggravation, um, aggravation or enhancements of the penalty determinations that you will make. So um, without further ado, um, I think Mr. Miller is going to talk to us about some of the resources that, are, that you can refer to as we go through this, the discussion today. Thank you, Marcin. The resources, carrying through the theme that we talked about in the last hour, the book has resources on liability auditing as well. Uh, for the first time, I think there's a comprehensive treatment of penalties, both civil and uh, uh, criminal. As, there's also a description of the various defenses, uh, the good faith paperwork, uh, the good faith uh, defense, substantial compliance, statute of limitations, uh, the uh, ICE uh, prosecutorial discretion. Uh, if you recall that the uh, 1991 version of Form I-9 was actually used for 16 years. So in, in a real respect, that makes the uh, audit, external auditor's job a lot easier. You know that there's that 16-year window that the 1991 uh, I-9 form was permissible. Also, those list, that list A, B, and C was permissible as well. It was only until April 3rd, 2009, when the unexpired document rule uh, was put into uh, uh, effectiveness. So these are, from the last panel, we talked about intrins intrinsic factors. The chronology of your I-9 is crucial, but you do have one important uh, window to remember, along with the other dates we gave you, and that is, uh, the 16-year <coughs> effectiveness of Form uh, I-9 with the 1991 version. Uh, the other thing that I think Marcin did a tremendous job in the book in, in Chapter 7 is giving you uh, the, the criminal uh, aspects of, of the audit. Uh, I know that uh, uh, Department of Justice will have a unique uh, point of view apart from the auditor, but uh, the ex external auditor, but nevertheless, it's important for you to be aware of the harboring and pattern and practice uh, violations because, in a real sense, you're going to find out, and uh, you know, the, the, the forfeiture that you see in the situation with money laundering, uh, that, that forfeiture uh, is real. And, and you've yes. seen it, I'm sure, Mr. Lee. I've, I've read cases about that. Yeah. It, it goes back to criminality. Yeah. In the IFCO prosecution, the forfeiture was, was, at that time, the record. It was over $20 million. And we have, a, we have two panels this afternoon dealing with those issues. So look forward to um, more details on criminal cases and on negotiating. And the, and the, the thing that Marcin has done a tremendous job, again, is taking the ICE 2008 Pen penalty memorandum and actually explaining it. And remember that, and I don't want to, I don't want to steal uh, uh, her theme, but there, there's, there's some real difficulties in using the ICE 2008 pen penalty mem memorandum. The broad theme of the external audit is remediation, the cure, the correction. Uh, in slide five, Remediation, reduction of liability. Remember that when you're doing an external audit, you're going to do a penalty assessment actually twice. You're going to do it once uh, after the I-9 uh, audit, and then you're going to do it again after remediation uh, because you're going to have a different penalty figure uh, after remediation, hopefully. Uh, remember 
that uh, there's just a difference in the treatment of a missing I-9 under the, uh, uh, the virtue memorandum. Uh, we know that ICE sa says that after a NOI, after a notice of inspection, it's that wonderful acronym that we keep using, NOI, uh, notice of inspection. After the NOI, uh, ICE takes the position that remediation of missing I-9s is uh, not permitted and that it would be a substantive uh, violation. Okaho has taken the position that remediation prior to the NOI is desirable. Why? Mitigation of, of penalties uh, and, and that's something that is an ongoing responsibility of the compliant employer. Remember that you have an ongoing duty as an employer to continue to maintain your I-9s, to present them upon uh, uh, the inspection notice. But past the inspection notice, you have a duty to continue to uh, re-verify for non-immigrants, to maintain according to the retention rules, to uh, observe the statute of limitations. So what, what liability auditing does, in a real sense, Chris alluded, Christo alluded to it this morning. Um, what you're doing is you're taking potential liability. In the case of a NOI, it's a contingent liability. For public companies to have I-9s on the books that are unremediated, even apart from the NOI, is a contingent liability. And so the public companies, the companies that have to report to the SEC, must keep that in mind, that, that you have those contingent liabilities until they're remediated properly. Um, I, I uh, Marcine, I think that uh, takes it to uh, the paperwork violations, which would be slide seven. I think I should give you the clicker. So, um, <laughs> um, so I wanted to bring up when you're talking about remediation um, and when to me remediate. So, Chuck, not to just throw something at you, but here we are, a situation you've been issued annoy your client, and they're scrambling. They got three days in which to turn over the documents, and they find out, holy smokes. I have a number of I-9s that are just missing. How did that happen? Of course, everyone starts pointing fingers. You know how that goes. And they're saying, well, what do we do? What do we do? And uh, so we had this discussion. And uh, you know, it seems like in different jurisdictions, they do different things. I, I, I think in this area, um, I would go ahead and tell my employee, the, in, the company, to go ahead and make the corrections to all the 99s so you have them all present and available, not back date, put the date that is current there so basically um, the special agent or for forensic auditor will know that it was done after the NOI was issued um, and then let them make a decision on whether or not they want to penalize you or not. And I think in different jurisdictions, the penalties are quite different. Um, also, I just learned from um, a colleague of mine in Alabama that they um, do it a little differently in it on instructions of their uh, worksite enforcement agency has asked them to actually backdate but indicate backdate which is odd but indicate the day that you're you were backdating it so um, so anybody in the future could clearly see that you backdated it in the date you backdated it um, this council from, uh, was smart to, to note that this was in writing, that the, works, that the ICE officer actually told them and instructed them to do such. Otherwise, I would say backdating is a no-no um, in my book. Um, so back to continuing violate, okay, so we're talking about I-9 paperwork violations on Chuck's slide here. Um, and I think he already alluded to this in the prior um, panel. Continuing violations until corrected or cured, um, or until the I-9 is no longer required to be retained. Um, that's, that's, that's pretty much the rule. And so basically, as you can see here, if you don't cure or correct, 
your I-9, you'll be violated, and here's the penalties, okay? So you can look in your book and see it, so I'm not gonna go through each and every penalty violation, but the range of penalties before uh, 929, 1999 is, uh, is $100 and $1,000, okay? And they have a range, and we'll talk about how you come to the range for each I-9 violation. So of course, you wanna argue the $100 and, um, and not the $1,000. So we'll kind of talk about ways that you may be able to do that. And then on the last panel, they're gonna talk about negotiating with ICE um, in, in that context. Um, violations on or after um, 929, are substantially higher and you have the statutory guidelines and how they came up with the inflation for the penalties. So you have 110 and 1100 for each individual, not all around each individual I-9 violation. Um, and you're thinking, why, you know, why does it matter that I have to go back to 1999 and have that penalty scale up on my screen? Well, it matters because you will have, for an employer that's been around for more than 12, 15 years, they're gonna have employees on their books um, that you can actually take the lower penalty for instead of the, you know, $100, you're gonna be able, I mean, the, one, uh, the $110, you can take the $100 because the violation may have happened um, if it's maybe um, continuing, uh, non-continuing violation, timeliness violation, at that point you can probably go ahead and take, uh, take a lower penalty. And that might not be the best example as Chuck might explain to you later. Um, so timeliness violations um, are not considered continuing violations um, and then the statute immediately runs. Um, I know you spoke about this earlier on the panel. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about that or should we move on to the defenses? I want, let's go to the defenses because I, I want to uh, continue the auditor training today. I know you, you, you folks uh, uh, can get uh, California CLE and talk to the folks up front of uh, uh, the Rock Center staff about uh, how, how you'd uh, uh, get your California 5.25 hours of, of CLE. Uh, I want to uh, show you the difference between the two good faith defenses. And it's a little bit confusing and I want you to come away from this particular CLE with, with these defenses uh, clear in your mind. The first is the IRCA uh, general statutory good faith defense, and that's for knowingly hired violations. So your best defense for a knowingly hired violation is that the employer verified properly a facially authentic uh, documents, and that the employer relies on, on those facially authentic documents to, to uh, verify in, in section two. If the employer has done that, the, the employer is entitled under the statute for a good faith defense, unless the employer has constructive or actual knowledge of the worker's unauthorized uh, work status. Remember in Mester, I wanted, I, I would be remiss if I didn't in this CLE talk about the role of Peter Larrabee in, in, uh, in I-9 work. Uh, Pete is uh, retired, but uh, took the Mester case and did a magnificent job of raising nearly every single possible uh, defense that an employer could, could do in the Mester case. And of course, the Mester case stands for the proposition of uh, once a notice is given by the government that two weeks to wait to, to uh, take adverse action against the uh, employee is too long. Of course, today we have ICE policy that will direct you uh, with, with different guidelines. And I, I, I commend to you, read carefully the notices you do get from from ICE, if you get a notice of suspect documents, read it carefully. Read the book about the notice of suspect documents. If you get a notice of discrepancies, again, mention in the book, we have a terrific, the one great thing about the ABA is they index this book wonderfully. 
So you're able to find these uh, topics well, both in the, in, the, uh, in the index and in the table of uh, contents. Uh, the other type of good faith defense that you must keep in mind is the virtue memorandum. That is a different good faith defense. It goes to paperwork violations. And that's the famous substantive versus technical and procedural uh, differences. So to maintain that good faith defense, what that says basically is when ICE comes a knocking, if that I-9 has nothing but technical problems with it or procedural problems, they cannot issue a NIF, again the acronym, Notice of Intent to Find, or a complaint unless a 10, day, 10 business day notice is given to the employer to give the opportunity mm -hmm. to cure under the Virtue Memorandum. The Virtue Memorandum implemented one of the uh, most interesting stories about IRA-IRA, and that is the Sonny Bono Amendment. Not Bono, that's a different generation, that's you too. This is Sonny Bono, who was married to Cher and had a show. God, when was that? Are you dating yourself again? Jeez. It was, Sonny and, it was a Sonny and Cher show, and I, I, I think I even watched it. But, but nevertheless, nevertheless, Sonny Bono later on became mayor of Palm Springs and then became a congressman. And uh, before, before he was mayor of Palm Springs, he owned uh, a restaurant in, uh, in Palm Springs called Bono. And uh, when, <laughs> when Ira Ira uh, uh, was, was passed, Sonny Bono, the late Sonny Bono, uh, introduced an amendment that provided this 10 business day uh, uh, notice. So in your mind, when you hear the name Paul Virtue, you should also think of Sonny Bono. So the Virtue Memorandum, and now, now you know the difference between the, the Virtue Memorandum, the Sonny Bono Amendment, and the good faith paperwork violation uh, defense, and the good faith uh, duty of the employer to, to look at authentic documents in a, in a good faith kind of way. Uh, Paul, Paul Virtue and Sonny Bono aren't anything alike, by the way. I'd just <laughs> like to point that out for those of you that um, know Paul Virtue. <laughs> the, other, the other important uh, thing to remember about the Virtue Memorandum is that, is that uh, important September 30th, 1996 cutoff. Before September 30th, 1996, uh, timeliness violations were substantive, but are barred by the statute of limitations. Anyway, after uh, September 30th, 1996, timeliness violations are considered uh, uh, technical and procedural and curable. The last thing is, the last slide is uh, mitigation and defenses. And that's just a summary of what we've just talked about. We've talked about, uh, in the other uh, panel, we talked about the five-year statute of limitations. Uh, that it's told at various times depending on whether it's, it's a paperwork violation, a timeliness violation, or a knowing uh, violation. So keep that in mind that there's different to uh, 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 the, the statute of limitation tows, tolls differently depending on what type of violation it is. Um, and remember there's also a general substantial compliance defense as well. And Judge uh, Thomas, who's the current administrative law judge uh, has, has given uh, credence again to the substantial compliance uh, defense. Marcy? So, you know, I went to law school thinking I really wouldn't have to deal with a lot of math. And, well, here we have substantive and uncorrected technical violations, fine schedule, and the calculations that go along with it. Um, so bear with me as, um, as I know there's a lot of attorneys out in the audience, so I'll try to do this step by step. And basically for um, paperwork violations, show you how to calculate the range of penalties, um, how to calculate the base penalty, and how to mitigate and enhance penalties as an external auditor as you should be doing for your client um, before the noise comes at their doorstep. 
It is in the book. It is also, there is a handout that has the chart. It's on page 200 and 367. And this, this is just for the civil panel, for the I-9 um, <coughs> paperwork violations. We haven't listed the penalties for the knowingly hired and continuing to employ um, fine schedule up there, but um, the calculation is done basically the same in the same methodology. So, uh, we just talked about the statute. You see the 110 as the first offense, and you see the third offense being the higher range at 1100. Um, 1100. Um, so, you have the range there. They've put this, they've scaled it so, and this is an ICE, the 2009, 2009 ICE penalty memorandum. So they put the first offense as 110, they have the second offense as 550, and then moving on to the third offense, all of them, as you can see, is at the higher end. But what they do, and what we call, they call the, their enhanced matrix, matrix is that you need to divide the number of substantive, that's or uncorrected technical violations, so any violations that could not be, or what an ICE auditor would see were, are not corrected within the 10 day period, will then turn into substantive errors, which you can be fined for, and that is a violation. So you need to take, divide the number of the substantive violations by the number of employees to whom Form I-9 should have been prepared to obtain the violation. So it's not the ones that you have on hand, it's the ones for all the employees that should have been I-9. Okay, so once you come out, calculate that, you come out with a percentage. And um, this, by the way, is not in the, in the regulate, it's not in the statute. Okay, this is not statutory. This is guidelines out of ICE. Wait a minute, Marcin. I'm getting a little confused. I'm confused because ICE has promulgated a chart and is using it in all NIFs and complaints and, yes. is, and is adding in a baseline percentage total, total substantive violations and the number of I-9s that should have been created? Yes. Well, I thought the statute said that every, every violation is supposed to stand on its own. Why yes. are they adding in <clears throat> This formula, I just simply don't understand where it came from. Well, I wish I could give you an answer to that because I just don't know where this came from either. But nonetheless, you as an external auditor need to pay attention to this calculation because that is what ICE is using to calculate the penalties. And we use this probably as the maximum range. What is Judge Thomas? I mean, we know that, that there's only one administrative law judge in the whole country right now that's doing INA 274A penalty cases, right? Yes, Judge Ellen K. Thomas. What does Judge Thomas think about the ICE baseline percentage calculation? Well, there is a case, the new China Buffet case, which um, she did not go ahead and accept the penalty scale of ICE their enhanced um, matrix. Um, so down the line, I would say, you know, ICE is giving you the maximum and you may have better odds if you end up down the road at Judge Thomas's um, courtroom. But, um, you know, there's also a lot of strategic things that you need to think about when you want to go down that path. Would it be better to try to negotiate something better, which you will learn about in our last panel of the day? Um, or is your client really prepared to go to court and um, expend the time, effort, and energy to do so? So anyway, Judge Thomas has not accepted their penalty scale, but yet we are, this is what you're gonna see in your NIFs and complaints. So back to math, here we go. So let's, let's make this easy. Let's take, for example, you have 100 I-9s, the total out there, 100 employees, 100 I-9s. And out of that 100, you found 10 violations. I'm making this easy. So 10%, whoa. So you go down, you see 10% to 19%. Wow. Is this the first offense? Hopefully, because the penalties is 275. If not, 
second offense, it's more, and the third offense, you're going to be hit with the upper end scale. Um, which actually happened recently, um, actually in Snack Attack, a recent case, 10 Okoho uh, 1137 of 2010, I believe, um, the employer failed to complete any of their I-9s. And it was roughly 100. So wow, that's bad. Luckily, it was this, in, this you know, it's Snack Attack is a subway, it, otherwise subway. Um, so luckily, it was their first offense. But not luckily, because if you look, 50% or more, it's 935. And that's not the total base penalty. It's 935 per I-9. So he's looking, they were looking at $93,000 or more. Yeah, so and there's a guy in the math helping me out there, doing the calculations for me, thank goodness. Um, that's a lot of money. And that's not even counting any of the next scale we will get to, which is called the mitigation or aggravation of this new base that you came up with. So you have a new base. Okay, so everybody on board with me here? Okay. So I'm gonna skip forward to show everyone now what they have to deal with. Okay, so this is actually in regulations, ERCA provided for five factors that must be given, due consideration in making a determination regarding um, the amounts of penalties. Um, as you can see, you have aggravating, mitigating, and you have neutral. And the five factors that we are all obligated to look under and required to um, are the size of the business of the employer being charged, the good faith of the employer, um, the seriousness of the violation, whether the individual was an unauthorized or authorized alien, and what the wor workforce looked at, um, looked like, so depending on where you're at with your, um, with your audit, and the history of previous violations. So these factors come into play, and when you're talking about a substantial amount of a base penalty, aggravating or mitigating, let's say, um, 5% or if you are aggravated 25%, that could be a lot of money. So um, these are factors that really need to be considered. Uh, size of the business. Let's just talk, let's talk about that a little bit. Why did you point to me when you said size of the business? I think that's a fat joke. <laughs> no, 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 Mr. Miller. No, I, I, do, I, do, I do have a question for yeah, you. Yeah, I know you have a question. I, I have a That's question why I for you. you. Uh, I understand that, that Judge Thomas is an excellent jurist. And in both New China Buffet, she bifurcated the, the substantive uh, law and the penalty provisions and invited ICE to, to give evidence as to how this chart should be accepted as, as her, uh, into her decision. And she, she merely ruled that that I did not meet that burden of proof. Um, I submit to you that in looking at the uh, the part that you're looking at now is called the actually called the enhancement ma matrix. That's that's statutory and regulatory. I don't think we really have a problem with, with that part of it. Uh, the the part, of course, that that is objectionable is the baseline percentage adding in. And I always like to refer that as when you go to a restaurant and you uh, have a large party and they add a, 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 sur a, a surcharge, a service surcharge for a large party, usually it's 17 or 18 percent. Then you get your credit card, you get your credit card slip back and there's a, they've already added in the 17 or 18 percent surcharge for service. And then on your credit card slip, there's a blank for uh, gratuity. That's pretty much what, what ICE is doing when they put in this uh, baseline percentage into the calculation. It's double dipping. Uh, and and it's, it's, at this point, Okaho does not agree. So the question for the external auditor is how do you show this dichotomy, this discrepancy? And the answer, of course, is that you should show the calculations both ways. You should show the contingent liability, as Chris Stowe talked about this, this morning, on the books both ways, both 
calculating how ICE would do it. And remember, the, the, the difficulty with the NIF and the complaint reflecting these guidelines is that at the, at the end of the day, if you don't take the case to the administrative law judge in a timely fashion, the NIF becomes the complaint and becomes, the, uh, becomes a, a penalty. I'm sorry, the NIF becomes the penalty and there's no need to go to a complaint. Um, uh, I'm sorry, the complaint would be issued, but if it's unanswered, the, the NIF stands. The other difficulty for the employer is that they may think that they can repose by the fact that they've received this NIF penalty. Or if they're taking it to, uh, to the administrative law judge, that they can rely on that. The answer, of course, is there's nothing stopping ICE from coming back the next payroll period and conducting a new inspection by doing a new, the acronym NOI, Notice of Inspection. So the answer is there's no race judicata just because they've issued a NOI at one, at one snapshot. They can issue a NOI again and go through this whole process. But the danger for the employer at the second go-round is that if you've received uh, a notice of suspect docs or a notice of, of discrepancies and the employer has not remedied it or, or followed through, is if that alien is there, I'm sorry, if that employee is there, you run the risk of a continuing to employ problem. So the dilemma for the for the employer is, is take it to the ALJ and you may get a reduction in the ultimate penalty. But nevertheless, you have a continuing, ongoing, as we already have seen, an ongoing statutory obligation to maintain your verification and retention requirements. So I maintain to you as an external auditor to keep all these factors in mind. And when you're ad, ad, giving remediation advice to the employer, bear this in mind and advise them uh, about this. OK, so now that you broke my uh, redundant, boring examples on math, now, we, you know, now back, to the, back to the nitty gritty guys. OK, back to the math. OK, so we're looking at business size of the employer. You, you wanna, you're hoping that you can either have a neutral or better yet to be able to mitigate that base penalty. Because if you're looking at snack attack, $93,000, we'd love that 5% mitigation. So unfortunately, unfortunately, case law has no real bright line test on um, size of a business. So there's some cases say three to 25, but then in fi we found in other cases that with 120 employees, they said, well, that's still a small company. So what all the case law is really showing is they show um, there's other factors that they really take in consideration. They talk about the revenue of the business. They talk about the amount of the payroll. They talk about turnover. Because you could have a lot of I-9s, but if you have a lot of turnover, such as a snack attack where they maybe only had seven or eight employees at one time, but there was a lot of turnover in that three-year period. So if you had a lot of that, that would count into thinking about whether the, com the company or the employer was big or small um, and the length of time that the, the employer has been in business. Um, and this is really the burden of ICE to show this. So those are the factors um, in the leading case of Felipe, which if you haven't read that case, um, it's at 1 Okaho 93. It's at 1989 case. But what's special about this case is it's pretty, uh, it's the only case that has been affirmed by Coho. So it's basically authority. So I'd go back and read that case. Um, and we'll be talking about it here because um, it gives us great guidance to um, how Judge Thomas is going to be um, ruling on the end of the day and in, at your particular, if, if your case actually comes to her. Um, so the next category we have is good faith of the employer. Um, 
And in the Felipe case, um, they, they said that to demonstrate good faith, you had to be honest and show a reasonable effort to comply with the law. Well, there was a case, New China Buffet, where you had really good compliance on the part of the employer. They fixed their I-9s, they tried to do this and that, they, you know, uh, the inspector wanted additional documents, et cetera, et cetera, they were, they were complying. But um, they failed, basically, to, um, in all of their um, section two, in all of their I-9s to complete section two. And at the end of the day, Judge Thomas said, you know, good faith should be looked at in terms of pre noise pre-investigation from work, work site enforcement. So really, it's back to remediating before the noise comes. So, um, and most of, the, most of the cases, they're looking at whether to aggravate or mitigate. So to get a mitigation, she's saying that you have to show good faith prior, prior to the noise. Um, but for bad faith, to get an aggravation, to get an enhancement of that plus five, you actually have to find a finding of bad faith. So bad faith would be, you know, employer failed to cooperate with ICE and on any level. Um, maybe there were some perjured documents, backdating, um, et cetera. Maybe this is their second offense. So for enhancement, you have to find bad faith. For uh, mitigation, you have to find um, good faith on the part of the employer prior to the NOI being issued. Otherwise, it'd probably be a, new, it'd be a neutral. Um, seriousness of a violation. Um, it's a continuum scale between the most egregious violations. That would be the five, a deliberate refusal to complete an I-9, down to something like forgetting to check a box. Um, unauthorized aliens. Hmm. So, Chuck. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about how we should be looking at um, this particular category for unauthorized aliens? It's for that particular. For exactly for the enhancement matrix, whether I should give it a plus or a minus. So some judges, you know, have factor in the penalty um, such that um, if you had any unauthorized workers on your work site, um, they would aggravate the penalty. Why others would say if you you know, it, so, so Judge Snyder would actually, so Judge Snyder, and, he, and he's in particular, he would mitigate the penalty if he found no unauthorized workers were on the work site. He would altogether mitigate, but recent judges have not, have not actually taken that mitigation. They would just give it a neutral. But if they found that there was a lot of unauthorized workers on the sites, they're going to enhance the penalty. I think that uh, the statute requires uh, looking at whether the particular violation, the, the uh, worker was unauthorized, is, is how the, the correct analysis should be. But I just want to commend Snack Attack to your careful reading. Uh, Judge Thomas and Snack Attack basically uh, took, the, took a, a, what I thought was a pretty messy fact pattern and uh, reduced the ultimate penalty on a discretionary basis. She looked at the five statutory factors, but came in uh, on the low side. And the apparent reason for her rationale of doing this was the fact that, again, she offered ICE. I keep looking at Mr. Lee. That, you're ICE, so I got to look at you when I say this. They offered ICE, she offered ICE the opportunity to introduce evidence uh, that there were unauthorized uh, uh, workers, and and ICE failed to do so, uh, and and primarily for that reason, apparently she used a discretionary standard, which is not uh, uh, violative of the statute statute at all. It, it's a discretionary statute, and so, apparently this was. So the, basically, the, what you're telling me is that everything that I've been teaching everyone for for the last 10 to 15 minutes, I should just throw out the window? Because yes, I mean, Judge Thomas does something very interesting in Snack Attack, but this is, un this is um, just like a former judge. 
back in the Felipe case in Wooden Stuff, where this, they had a failing business, it was small, it was basically gonna go bankrupt. It's gonna have to pay substantial fines because it didn't, it, its compliance was very poor. But instead of bankrupting this small company, which Judge, Judge Snyder did, he basically put aside those large penalties and used his discretion to minimize the penalties. And so that's what you're saying, that's what Judge, Judge Thomas did in Snack Attack as well. Apparently, I mean. Apparently, yeah. That's the apparent, again, there was, there was an, uh, she offered the issue up and, and didn't see uh, an evidentiary re resolution to carry the, the burden of proof. So look at the facts and the case that you have and see if there's perhaps some kind of means that you could mitigate. Um, and then when you're looking at, I guess, in the negotiations panel, see how you can use Judge Thomas's um, decisions to help you in your negotiations with ICE. Right. Clear as to whether that's mitigating or aggravating, or what do you do with business size? Um, so it, it 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 depends. So if it is, if they considered, and it's the burden on ICE to prove this. But okay, let's say so you're sitting there and you look at the company and you're saying, okay, it's like a subway shop, and you have in and out employees, and even though you might have a thousand employees let's say in that time period for all their different shops, you know, there's only two or three workers on there. They have no HR team. They have, um, the revenues are very small. I would probably categorize it as a bit, as a small business and I would go for, mi for mitigating. So a small business, small business would be mitigating yeah. category and a large business. Okay. Yeah. Right. okay, but he might have, he might differ with me because it's no, unclear. I'm not, I'm not, no, I'm not, I don't dare. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I think that it's a rule of proportionality more than anything else. It looks like what Judge Thomas is doing is she's, she's looking at the ability, regardless of the, of the relative ability of the employer to, to meet its verification responsibilities properly. And, uh, you know, it's akin to the type of logic that you see in, in the E2 uh, uh, category for those of you who are are business immigration lawyers. There's there's a rule of proportionality for size of the investment. I would just I would just commend to you that it's that type of analysis. Again, it's a rule of proportionality. And all the cases seem to come back to, and this is maybe more in the criminal law venue, but you want to make the penalty such that it hurts. So for a small business to bankrupt it, that, that's not in proportion to what you want to do to it. You want to make it understand that there's compliance issues that it needs to follow. But for a big company, if you're going to give them a, a small little fine, I mean, if you're really going to say, hey, you need to comply, you're going to hit them with something a little bit harder because that's going to hurt them, okay? So, it, yeah. So in, in all the cases seem to come, kind of come back to that on this particular um, size of a business. Pretty interesting. Um, I just want to quickly touch upon the history of prior violations um, and then move on. So some judges have granted full mitigation on the penalty if there are no prior history of prior violations. However, other judges have used this factor to only enhance or aggravate the penalty if there was a prior history of previous violations. So um, it seems like I would just try to argue full mitigation when if if, they, if ICE tries to argue aggravation, um, and I would cite Felipe because he used to mitigate for that particular factor. There was no prior violations. We're gonna give, the, give this company a mitigation and help them out, okay? So versus the judges these days, we'll pro, um, we'll, they're just looking at enhancing the penalty, enhancing. So I, 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 would, I would look at the case law and see what you can do. Um, otherwise, you're going to get, instead of a mitigation, you might just get a neutral, which doesn't help you. So um, if you have no prior violations, I'd say work that. Um, I think we need to move on some other topics and get away from calculations. So actually, I'm so good at this now. Um, so um, 
the resulting amount that you have per count, so to sum everything up, so let's just take, if you have any knowingly hiring and continuing to employ issues, you'll look at that fine scale, do your calculations with the aggravation and mitigation, and then you're going to look at your violations for paperwork and see what the base penalty is. Then you're going to do aggravation and mitigation, and you're going to come out with a sum. Um, and where are we going to find this sum? On the Ice Otters NIF complaint. Are we not? I want to go really quickly through this because I think it is important, but I do want to hear from Alana as well because yes. I'm, I'm fascinated by the subject of anti-discrimination. Oh, and it's very important, and we need to get to that topic. Yeah, but I think just like in golf and baseball, how you keep score is really important. Uh, so, uh, one thing you should take away from uh, is that only one substantive violation per employee uh, will be charged in a NIF or complaint, and, and that's very important to see. Similarly, only one knowing violation per employee will be charged in a NIF or complaint. It's a very simple uh, concept, but it's very important because that allows you to properly do the audit. If you see a substantive violation, you can go on. You don't have to worry about the virtue memorandum and technical violations, and ICE will take that position. Once they see a substantive violation, they just go on, because they're going to charge that. And so slide 16 uh, basically is saying the same, same thing over again. All you're, all you're doing is, and you can, you can audit much quicker when you see that, when you see that all you need to find is one substantive violation, the external auditor, however, has a different responsibility than the ICE auditor. The ICE auditor is quickly going to see, to see that substantive violation because they're going to charge. I have, I have my colleague, who's a former INS attorney, uh, nodding in agreement. The reason why, folks, it's a statutory uh, uh, provision. It's a statutory, very similar to the old deportation charges and allegations. If you look at, if you look at the charges in the book, you'll see that the, the model charges and allegations for the complaints and the NIFs. Very similar to uh, the, the uh, and, and not, by, not by any uh, 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 coincidence, looks really similar to an allegation uh, uh, of, of in, in, a, in a removal proceeding. Because again, it's a statutory, uh, it's a statutory uh, uh, complaint. Uh, NIFs uh, and, and, and uh, the next slide, NIFs and stat uh, complaint statutory counts, that just shows you exactly what I, I've just said. Those are the types of, of, um, uh, of allegations or, or, or complaints that, that can be made, charges. And then uh, I just want to commend to you one final concept, the idea is that the responsibility of the external auditor is much broader. You're not just looking for INA 274A violations. You're not just looking for knowing uh, hires or continuing to employ violations. You're also looking for uh, perm re, re, uh, labor certification, permanent labor certification retention violations. You're looking for H-1B benching and, and public access violations. You're looking for what Alana is going to be talking about, uh, uh, anti-discrimination. So it's a broader responsibility. Thank you. So, Giving it Alana the control. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I will try and remember to press forward. Oh, here. Um, well, thank you, and I know that anti-discrimination was covered in the last panel a little bit. But I think it, it is one of those subjects that needs to not be forgotten. Um, we all can get involved in the paperwork violation and how, is it, how are those I-9s being completed. But at the, um, at the beginning of all of this, there are humans involved in, in the hiring practices. And even if, you're, even if you're not doing an audit, an external audit, before you even do the audit, you're, you're, you as attorneys are counseling employers on how to make you know how to go about their hiring process and hopefully getting involved in those um, hiring processes the other day I was contacted by a new corporate client it's a, an HR that I've known for years um, 
and she just moved on to a new, a new um, company. They made an offer to a woman uh, who is going to be coming into the United States, married to an L1, she's gonna get an L2 EAD, um, and they sent me her offer letter and I went, oh my God, because on that offer letter it said, you need to present an EAD. I was like, you can't do that. Um, you know, and I went back and I said, let's, you know, let's change your offer letter. Let's put, here's some IRCA compliance information to have in there. And um, by the way, has, has Employment Council taken a look at your offer letter? Because I had noticed a few other things that um, I thought should be looked at. And she thanked me and she said, I'll, I'll have Employment Council look at this. Um, but these things come up in, in the real world practice that we do, um, where you think you're talking to HR about a new case and then something else pops up and you're not really, you know, you're not auditing right then, you're just going, you're just having the um, oh my God moment of what are you putting into writing and is anybody looking at this? Um, so these are things that, that come up in an everyday practice. So we've already talked about, not yet, not yet. So we've already talked about, you know, section 274A and all those paperwork things and that you gotta check off and what ICE is gonna look for, but the employer has this balancing act because at the same time they want to be in compliance, they also want to make sure that they are following all of the requirements for the anti-discrimination and unfair immigration related employment practices. And I swear that's why they gave me this section was so that I would have that tongue twister. Um, so if I say it wrong, I have been trying all weekend to say it right. Um, but it is a tongue twister. Uh, so. The employer is trying to balance between adherence to IRCA rules for I-9 completion and then how do I not discriminate? And there is this um, GAO, GAO report that is um, cited on the Civil Rights Commission's Office of Special Counsel's website. And they cite this report and that confirms that the form I-9 process has led to discrimination. Hey, fancy that. Would you, would you imagine employers are scared to death that they're going to do something wrong so they don't want to hire somebody who may make them do something wrong? Hmm, interesting. Um, and primarily they're seeing discrimination or, or hi bad hiring decisions being made that are against US citizens and work authorized individuals who were Hispanic or Asian. Hmm, fancy that. So the GAO report goes on and also discusses the findings in the, of the area of confusion for employers had regarding the proper procedures for completing that Form I-9 and about the appropriate documentation that could be presented and accepted. Well, thank you Congress because they tried to address the anti-discrimination sections. Um, and they gave us Section 274B. And it's clear as mud, okay? Um, that's my interpretation of it, is that they give you an awful lot of words, but they, I don't think they make it any easier for an employer to balance. So in addressing their concerns about anti-discrimination and unfair immigration related employment practices, they first of all applied the rules to larger employers, meaning anybody who has more than three employees. So if you have four or more, you, you need to pay attention to this. If you are a solo practitioner with a paralegal, hey, you don't have to comply. The rest of us have to comply, and your clients have to comply because most of you probably don't have that really small employer. Um, so they broke it into four types of unlawful conduct that an employer can commit. Um, the first is citizenship and immigration status discrimination with respect to hiring, firing, and referring or recruiting for a fee. This discrimination occurs when the employer treats somebody different because they perceive them as potentially being um, foreign or sounding foreign or looking foreign. Um, national origin discrimination prohibits the employers from treating individuals differently because of their place of birth, country of origin, native language. Now, um, this was mentioned in the last panel. Um, the IRCA anti-discrimination rules for this are going to cover employers size 4 to 14, anything above 14, and that's going to be under EEOC. Um, 
The next one is, uh, and this is the one that ties back most, most profoundly into the I-9 compliance, is the unfair documentary practices during the Form I-9 process. Um, and this happens when the employer doesn't like the documents that were presented. So here's an, an example here would be um, the human resources person is filling out the I-9. They notice on section one that the employer marked that they are a US citizen. Um, but the individual, um, let's just say, sounds foreign. And so the, and she presents to the HR, here's my driver's license, here's my unrestricted social security card. And the HR person says, says here you're a US citizen. Can, can you show me your um, birth certificate or your passport? Um, that's, that's bad. That's really, really bad. Um, the employer should be accepting whatever documents appear facially correct um, and relate to the individual. And they should not be asking for additional documents or different documents unless those documents don't comport with the list of acceptable documents. So if the individual presents, um, let's say, their passport and their driver's license, the, the, the employer should say, wait a minute, here's a list of acceptable documents. You can either give me one from the list A or one from B and C, and you choose. And I'm not, I, I really can't help you choose, but you need to choose which documents to present. Um, let's see. I can skip the other example, because you all got that one um, very well. So all of these first three categories of discrimination could occur as part of the recruiting and hiring of employees or in completing, um, in completing the verification process. So unless the information is freely volunteered by the individual, it's simply not permissible to ask. So when, when I'm counseling somebody on hiring procedures, I say, well, would you ask them if they have a child? Would you ask, are you married? No, you wouldn't ask those questions. So you won't also ask what you, you know, were you, were you born here, okay? So you want the, um, the employers to be in the habit of asking a general question. Uh, for example, if you, all, if you ask all applicants, do you have the right to accept unrestricted employment in the United States, that's acceptable. As long as everybody is asked the same question, it's, it's fine. What I would also counsel on doing is um, don't leave it up to HR, the recruiter, or the managers to make it up as they go along. Put it in the application form so that everybody is asked the same question so that if, they, if they're interviewing somebody and they think they were born in the United States, ah, I don't have to ask, ask that question. Don't leave it up to chance that they're going to say it in the right way and consistently ask it. Put it in an application form. Um, remember to say the words in exactly the same way. And also, you can put on the offer letter that you're going to have to comply with IRCA on your first day of employment and, and submit your, your um, documents by the third day of employment. Basically, the theme here is be consistent and treat everybody the same. Now, the fourth um, big no-no for employers is retaliation. I think this one's pretty straightforward. Um, you, can't, you can't go after a whistleblower. You can't go after somebody who is um, making a, filing a charge against you for discrimination. You can't go after somebody because they're helping one of your other employees who's going after you for discrimination. Um, so you, if they are engaged in IRCA or Title VII protected conduct, uh, you, you can't fire them, you can't terminate them, you can't hassle them. So the prosecutor for these claims, where, where the employee who's been wrong goes to, is the Office of Special Counsel. Um, and they're going to file, th they're going to file with OSC, and OSC would then be the investigative body and would be coming out after the employer. Um, and that's kind of just, you know, just so you know who, who, who the people on the other side are going to be. 
So now the other, the other thing to turn to, well, who's the protected class? Is it everybody? Is it the H-1B worker who's um, applying for a job? Is it the F-1 student? Um, no, it's not. The protected individuals are citizens and nationals of the United States, lawful permanent residents, temporary residents, asylees, and refugees. Um, of interesting uh, note, and I think that most employers are probably not aware of, is that the, you don't, you're not always a protected class. So if you're a lawful permanent resident and you, within six months of becoming eligible to naturalize, didn't apply for naturalization, you're no longer considered a protected class. Um, I don't know how the employer would show good faith in suddenly saying, well, I know he got his green card 10 years ago, so he's not protected and I, you know, I, it, it's a little nonsensical, but it was a, it's an interesting um, read in the, uh, in the statute. Um, and then the other interesting thing is that even with, if everything is equal and the employer can choose to hire a citizen over somebody else, as long as they are, that they are not discriminating based on, on any factor and all things are equal, they have a lawful permanent resident and a citizen, they're equally qualified, well, we're going to choose the U.S. citizen over the lawful permanent resident. It's in the statute. I don't think it's okay, but it's in the statute. It is, I think, it's, it's in the statute, and, and the only thing I could glean from it, and I welcome others yeah. you know, to, to help explain it to me, um, the only thing I can glean from it is that you, you, there's a, um, I think Congress thinks that, that if, you, if you're making the commitment to be in the United States, you should go, you should go whole hog and become a U.S. citizen. And um, it's, an in, it's an incentive, but no, m most people don't know about it. And most people are thinking about if I become a U.S. citizen, do I still have my property rights in my, in my home country? I mean, I, I have a lot of um, clients from India who, you know, one spouse will become a citizen of the U.S. and one will remain a, an Indian citizen for property issues. So, and then you get into, you know, state planning issues and try and lead them the other direction. Um, So now the next part is um, what's the external auditor's role? And I've talked about it from you know, the guidepost of me as the immigration attorney talking to my clients um, when they're setting up uh, their employment practices, flipping around to coming in and, and helping to audit whether it's a merger and acquisition, whether it is um, an employer choosing to be proactive and hire, hire somebody like me. Um, like Chuck, like any of you, to come in and do an audit, this would be one of the areas that I would also be looking at as an external auditor. Um, you have to review the compliance programs, and the compliance programs have to do with the hiring process, and you have to be um, cognizant of, of what you're looking for. So one of the um, particularly sensitive things is, is that you may tip the I-9 compliance um, into being considered something discriminatory. Um, so in the audit of the I-9 documents, you have to pay attention to the employment practices. So one of the examples that, um, that was discussed in, in the last panel, but I, I'll come back to it, was um, an employer discovers a number of missing I-9s. And under 274A and under the Okaho principles, you would want to mitigate that I-9 and have the, have the employee recreate the I-9. So under, under Section 274A and to be able to mitigate the, the potential fines, now you are talking about having the employee re-I-9. But the employee could claim anti-discrimination. What you can do in this case to, to um, bolster the fact that there is no anti-discrimination is Make sure that, that a standard communication is being used, that all employees are being treated the same, 
that you are communicating with tremendous sensitivity to those individuals who have to be, who you need to re I-9 in order to keep an I-9 compliance, um, but to be sure that the communication is very structured and ensures the individual that they are not being singled out um, at all. I think that there's a, a problem if all the people being re i 9 are, say, Hispanic. Um, but that may, that may in fact be what is happening if that's the majority of the, of, the work, of the workforce for that given employer. But you have to be extremely careful that you are saying this was an I-9 audit, it was the entire workforce, your I-9 happens to be missing, and we need to re-I-9 you. Um, and then we go back to, the, you know, to part of the question that um, Helena raised in the last panel, and that is when you're weighing you know, the, the pros and cons and you're looking at potential fines if you're ever audited versus possibly being sued for anti-discrimination, that becomes the, the purview, the decision is that of your client to make the decision, in my opinion, of, of what way you go, what way that employer goes and choosing the lesser of, of a couple of evils. So this whole panel comes back to the, the potential civil penalties. And the civil penalties are monetary. And then there's a whole bunch of other things that aren't monetary that could be, um, that, could, that could, I'm sorry, go ahead, we have a question. Uh, talking about, <clears throat> about um, replacing missing I-9s and that sort of thing, what if um, <clears throat> the person uh, the person who's an I-9 is not available, is not available, has left or is on medical leave or anyway is not available for some reason. <clears throat> well, under, under the, um, yeah, under, under the virtue memo, there is a provision that if the employee is not available, that uh, once, a, I think it's once the NIF is, is issued, there is a, a mitigating factor if the employee is not available. And of course you can, you can do a, a statement of some sort, a yes. sworn statement. Yeah. Okay. As, part of the, as part of the external audit, yes, and I, and I would also say once, once ICE comes in, you would also be doing it that way. Okay. So turning to the potential <coughs> penalty liabilities, um, there are determined by violation per, by the violations per person, and the penalties increase based on any prior violations under 274B for employers who were issued one or more. And here's a nice little chart. Now this includes, this does not include the um, document penalties. These are just the, for the um, citizenship. Um, this, I don't, I created this one, so I'm not sure if this is, this is written down in the book. I don't think the chart's in the book. Okay, and then um, additional potential penalties. Uh, there is um, for the document, unfair document practices, that ranges from 100 to 1,000 per violation. And then um, the other types of orders that could be uh, given against an employer is uh, to actually hire the person who was discriminated against, uh, to order a back pay for up to two years, uh, telling them, telling the employer, hey, post notices to your employees, uh, explaining their rights. It seems to me that the posting notice would be something that you would, you know, most employers would want to post anyway. Um, educating HR personnel in how to conduct hiring in a non-discriminatory fashion. Um, Removing false performance reviews. Uh, I found it interesting that this one was specifically mentioned that you know somebody might be putting in a false um, something into an employer employee um, file uh, in order to support their anti discrimination practice. Interesting. Um, compiling for review. This this would be a, a pretty big one for an employer, um, especially a large employer, would be to have to. Uh, put forward um, information on all applicants that they have considered for a three-year period. That would, be, that would be kind of hard for a big employer to, to do. And then um, 
attorney's fees. You know, the, you, the employer might have to pay the attorney's fees for their wronged employee. So it, it bears in mind uh, keeping anti-discrimination and unfair immigration related employment <laughs> practices, I got it all out, um, must be considered integral in any uh, review of employer compliance. And I will turn that over to you. Great. And I was told by Dan that we had to stop at 12.15, but I wanted to give the audience an opportunity to perhaps ask some questions to the panel or to our gracious ICE officer here that has had to sit through this panel and listen to us speak. Um, is there anybody that would like to raise some questions? Ellen. Everyone hear her question? You should use the microphone. Yeah, here. You're not shy, Ellen. Get up there. <laughs> Get up there. My question involves the obligation of an employer to verify the authenticity of documents presented. For example, the, a green card has many different versions. If a, an employer suspects that a green card may not be real, what should he or she do in terms of accepting it for I-9 purposes? Uh, anybody on the panel want to answer that question? Or Again, you, you have the duty. I should let Mr. Lee, if you want to take a swing at this one. You're <laughs> well, <clears throat> the first part of that question, there are, only two, there are only two versions of the green card that are valid right now. And there is that brochure, I forget the uh, form number, M that had the, M I believe so. Um, the current version only, ha the current version of that pamphlet only has two versions of the green card that are valid. And again, it goes back to, are they showing you prima facie documents? Okay, well what if, what if somebody just thinks it's fraudulent, despite their, their best attempts to, to study the acceptable documentation and they just, they, they smell, they smell a counterfeit document. It looks good, but for whatever reason, they just think it might not exactly comply with the little holographs or whatever are in there. The other mechanism in place to verify is e-verify. What if they're not on the e-verify program? That's right. If, if, if it looks facially authentic, uh, the, at, at the dawn of IRCA, that standard went in there because of exactly the type of, uh, and things were a lot more difficult, uh, you know, in 1987 when IRCA started to get um, enforced. So if you're not on, if the employer's not on E-Verify, if the employer is not uh, using the Social Security uh, database um, and you have a document that uh, on its face looks authentic, the employer is duty bound to accept it unless, and of course that's the other proviso of the, of the, uh, um, of the statute, unless you have constructive knowledge uh, or, or actual knowledge that, that the person is not authorized to work. It just seems like that would be an area that would be ripe for all sorts of problems and discrimination in particular. The, again, what, what, what employers talked about at the beginnings of IRCA is still true today, and that is they objected to being agents of, of the federal government and to be the, the archivists of, of documents. Uh, and Again, the, the reasonable employer standard is, is it, on its face, is it facially, does it appear facially authentic? And then you have the, the right to rely on uh, uh, the document and it's, it's a good faith uh, uh, defense. Uh, some employers, you know, I, 
I have to tell you, in the real world, employers have hunches and instincts and there's rumors, but I think that, that the reasonable employer really has to uh, uh, be careful. Again, Alana just talked about all the reasons why. Uh, you, you have to be careful and you have to uh, rely. What ICE might say back to you is that's a good reason to join E-Verify and Image because that, that's the, the way to protect, according to the federal government's point of view, uh, the employer. But if you're not a, if the employer is not a member of E-Verify or Image, and uh, you're really uh, stuck with, with that basic statutory uh, standard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. What percent of the uh, Fortune 1000 are members of E-Verify? Wow, that's a good question, good question. I don't know. We're, we're ha he's the, writing seriously. No, there is a list of companies on the ICE website that are members oh. of E-Verify and Image. I don't have the exact number. Uh, there are company names on there. Oh, good, so you can. ICE.gov, under the Image tab investigations, there is a list of companies who are image partners and partners of E-Verify. I don't know which ones are Fortune 1000 companies uh, on that list. I would say about, I saw it this morning, maybe about 200, 250 are full image partners. That includes E-Verify. Anybody have any further questions? Well, then that concludes our panel for the morning.